Welcome to the Vian Cinema Studio up here at TIFF, Mr. Alex Gibney. Firstly, great to see you again after you. Mayor Mexico Culpa and WikiLeaks back to back. Um, it's, it's always kind of interesting seeing how these subjects, even though we're going to talk about Lance Armstrong in a second, seeing how these subjects get treated in the media following your documentaries. After WikiLeaks, you know, I was kind of amazed at this story about how Bradley Manning, you know, had this other side of him, this female side to him that uh, seemed to be one of the driving forces behind why he reached out to anyone was just to grab onto someone to communicate with. Right. And then when we had the announcement, you know, a couple of weeks ago after the sentencing that he wants to be known Called as Chelsea. Norman, right. Everyone was like, <gasps> they were all like up in arms, all in shock. Like it was, and I was like, well, you guys should have really seen the documentary. For you, is that like an interesting thing to watch the the way things kind of creep out into the popular culture and media? It is. I mean, um, that one in particular, uh, you know, I was roasted in some quarters for even mentioning um, his gender identity issues, and uh, it was interesting to see suddenly it all change. Um, obviously, you're here for the Armstrong lie, and it seems like there's this consistent theme building, even if it was not intentional from the outset, where you've got these people of perhaps great intent or these institutions that represent grandeur in a, in a, in a, and, and good ethics, um, but they seem to be failing us. Um, with this one, how, how much of a surprise, given how smart we think you are, um, you know, how much of a surprise was it to you that it started out this way back in, you know, 2009 when, or, or whatever it was at first when you, when you kind of came on to the Lance Armstrong team for his comeback race and, you know, for the 8th Tour de France? Well, look, I mean, I didn't just fall off the turnip truck, so, you know, I did get us, I, I did know when I was starting about the rumors of doping. But nothing could be proved, and, and my assignment, in a way, was to follow his comeback. So that's what I, w I wanted to do, you know, and, and in a way I was kind of looking forward to that. Just a simple, straightforward comeback story. And we would flashback, we called it the road back, in, in a way, because that's about the comeback, but the road back is also, a way, you know, in the present, you go, you jump back to the past. So there was an element of it there, but I, I found it, you know, I thought I was going to be doing more of an inspirational story. Yeah. And uh, at what point did you, like, why the Armstrong lie? Why that title? Obviously a strong statement. It's also, in, you know, it's a lie that comes out of the movie. I mean, it, it, sorry, the title comes out of the movie because uh, the famous article that first came up with real evidence that he had doped is called Le Mensonge Armstrong, the Armstrong lie. Uh, and then later on, he attacks that lie. So there's something about that that seemed very powerful. And I think the lie is really the problem here. It's not so, to me, it's not so much the doping. Doping's against the rules, you shouldn't dope. But in that sport, all the top riders were doping. Yeah. The problem was not so much the crime, it's the cover up. And that, the cover up was the lie. And the lie was, was terrible because it was so big. He didn't just say, you know, I've never tested positive. He said, how dare you say that I, as a cancer survivor, would ever use performance-enhancing drugs? Yeah. Well, that implicates a lot of people, millions of people in your life. It's, it's always amazing to me how many people must have been on that team and how many people kept quiet for how long. In a similar case to, like, Tiger Woods, when that all kind of started falling apart, you wonder how many people were involved in this cover-up. Well, I think the... The amazing thing about this lie is that it was a lie in plain sight. I mean, everybody knew. There were hundreds of people who knew. You know, it's been presented, I think, in the press as Lance and a couple of, you know, yeah. conspirators, you know, hatched a plan in a dark back room, and they were the only ones who knew. No, everybody knew. It was an open secret. Right. But it was an open secret that Lance managed to choreograph in a way that, Nobody, it was like the emperor's new clothes. He said, look, I'm, uh, look, look at the fine raiments I'm wearing. Uh, isn't this a beautiful suit? Yeah. And everybody said, yeah, it sure is, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and fairly tight and like right. that. <laughs> um, but that's, that's the thing. You walking back into, I guess, the lion's den, so to speak, knowing the full truth and sitting down with Lance again. Um, 
obviously there's that relationship that's been built that you know that they you felt you both felt a need that, to reconnect and sit down and have this conversation. Um, but how did you actually feel with him? Did you feel oh like this is a guy I can still hang out with, or this is a guy who's wronged me? Both. Yeah. I mean, in a way, it was a it was a funny kind of negotiation because he had reached out to me a, a number of weeks before Oprah and told me directly, you know, that uh, that he had doped. Um, he apologized for having lied to me. Um, and he said, there are a lot of things about this that aren't right. Um, and I said, well, you, you really owe me a shot to sit down with you one more time. He said, yes, I do. So I think he also wanted to, to navigate the story. But what was interesting was over the course of a number of weeks, we would have conversations. And, you know, it's tricky for me. I don't want to pretend to anybody that I'm their friend or I'm going to tell their story in a way that um, they're going to like. My job is not to please them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but at the same time, you know, I have a relationship. And, I, and I, he had never treated me badly, except for the fact that he lied to my face. But, I mean, he had never, like, if you, if you look at a lot of people who had really been attacked by him, he'd never attacked me. Right. Um, so, you know, we had a relationship. We had some rather honest conversations. And I think over the course of those honest conversations about what he had done, we reached a reckoning where we could sit down and talk and be honest with each other, or you know, at least try to be honest with each other. Right. Well, that's the thing, and you see it in television every day, where someone's come on the stand and they're admitting that they lied on a prior occasion. They're like, "Well, are you lying now, or Correct. were you lying then?" Well, I think that's the problem, and that's a problem of trust, and it's a problem of doubt. It's a problem of of all sports now. Doubt is the problem. Like, is the guy or gal that I'm rooting for? Are they on the level or are they cheating in some way? You don't know. Um, and same thing when I sit with Lance, you know, I just got to be honest. He's just, I don't trust him now in terms of him telling me the truth. I have a sense based on his body language of when he is and when he isn't, but it's hard to know. And obviously Julian Assange started off in a similar sense. It's this kind of, um, you know, this figure who was out to expose things and bring truth and bring light ended up being a victim of his own paranoia. Lance, you know, uh, you know going down a, a road where he's fallen from grace. Does that mean we have to worry about Fela Kuti? Or is he going <laughs> to be all right? <laughs> well, Fela Kuti, I think he laid it all out in the open. So, uh, so you know, I think that Fela Kuti more or less said, here I am, you know, come get me. Um, I think that he, he's a different character than these other folks. These, these you know, Julian, I think, uh, Lance, they are afflicted with what I would call, we talked about it before, noble cause corruption. This idea that, you know, because I'm doing good, I'm entitled to be bad. Yeah. Um, well, we're looking forward to seeing Fella. When do we? When can we expect that? Finding Fella. It's it's getting close to being finished, so it's in the cutting room now, and should be the next one off the assembly line. Very cool. Well, always good to see you. Thanks. Good again. to see you. Goodbye. Thanks.